Chapter 20 Our group reached the glade, this time accurately determining its location. Listen, there is nobody here, Slava said doubtfully. Maybe this is not the right glade. It's the right one. I remember it well from the last time. Andre nodded affirmatively. Of course, grinned Kostya. We laughed, recalling our previous adventures. In about ten minutes, the senior guys started to arrive, joining in our good mood. Oh, the teacher will be here soon, Victor perked up. How do you know? I asked, looking up in the direction of his gaze. Because of samurai, the senior senpai replied, smiling. I shifted my gaze down and only then noticed the cat pacing grandly on a desolate fence in the light of a distant lamp, all the time almost falling down because of his treacherous paws, while trying hard to maintain balance. He always comes right before the meditation, continued the senpai. He sits quietly on the side in full trance, and then, without wasting his time on our conversations and impressions, leaves right away. The first time we came, he stayed until the end. Sensei was trying to catch him in the bushes, I remarked. Well, that was probably a little exception to his rules. Strange how that happened, I thought. Even the cat played an active part in it. The guys joined our conversation. Why did Sensei get a black cat? Asked Tatiana. He didn't actually get him on purpose. When Samurai was still a kitten, village kids almost stoned him to death. So Sensei picked him up from the street and healed him. Since then, the cat has been staying with him and doesn't leave his side. And who did that to his ears? Andre asked with a smile. Ah, that was him sparring with dogs. With dogs? Yeah. Samurai not only trains spiritually, but also practices martial arts, said Victor, drawing everyone's attention to the cat. One could say, since he was a kitten, Sensei has been teaching him the Wing Chun style, which is the opposite to the cat style. So now he picks fights with both cats and dogs. Are you joking? Andre was sincerely surprised. How is it possible to teach a cat kung fu? Even some humans don't understand it, while this is just a stupid animal. It depends on how you look at it, the teacher broke into the conversation, coming out from the dark. Sometimes a stupid animal turns out to be cleverer than some homo sapiens. Still though, Nikolai Andreevich was interested in the unusual fact. How did you teach him? Oh, it's very easy, Sensei said simply as if we were talking about something ordinary. In the form of a game. First I would capture his claws with my fingers, and then in the same way would show him how to get out of this hold. That's how he learned. Now, he not only fights cats, but also picks fights with dogs. You see, he's not interested in mice anymore. They are not at the right level. It seems I taught him to my own misfortune. Now I'm the one running around with the mouse traps. Everyone laughed. Meanwhile, I still didn't understand whether that was a joke or not. If that was a joke, then why was it so deep? And if it was true, then one really needs to have remarkable talent to teach a cat. Telling his story, Sensei was at the same time shaking everyone's hands. And when it was Andre's turn, the latter didn't give his hand bowing politely instead. What's wrong with you? Sensei asked, surprised. Well, I'm afraid to touch you after the other day's events, Andre replied half-jokingly. What do I have to do with that? Said Sensei, smiling and shrugging his shoulders. It's not me you should be afraid of, but him. It was he who was next to you, not me. While Sensei was speaking with the other guys, Andre gave Kostya a slight push on the side with his elbow. So it came through you. Come on, I'm smart, of course, but not that smart. I'm serious. So am I. Honestly? Honestly. Andre waited until Sensei answered another question and then asked, Is it true that you did it through a handshake? Of course not. Someday I'll tell you about it. The conversation then moved on to our meditations at home. At first, I wanted to get Sensei off to the side and speak to him alone about my thoughts, because I was afraid of the reaction of the senior guys. Who knows, maybe they would ridicule me with their sarcastic jokes, just like my friends. 
but Sensei patiently examined and explained every experience the guys had. I heard a story similar to mine from Yura, but not quite so acute. Seeing the serious mood of the others, I finally decided to tell Sensei everything in the presence of everyone. So, when another pause appeared in the conversation, my persona timidly started to share my achievements. Everybody listened quietly and attentively. Then, my persona grew utterly bold and told them about the trickster. After my story, there was a short silence. That's it, I thought. Now Nikolai Andreevich will diagnose me with schizophrenia. Why did I blab it out in front of everyone? But, to my surprise, Sensei said the following. It's a good result. To catch a thought of your animal nature is hard, while fighting it is even harder. In fact, it's impossible to fight this category of thoughts in general, because violence begets violence. And the more you try to kill them, the stronger they will manifest themselves in you. The best way to defend yourself against them is to switch over to positive thoughts. In other words, the principle of Aikido, of smooth withdrawal, should be used in this case. What if they are chasing me all day long? Can I just chop them off with some swear word? Asked Ruslan. No matter how you chop them off, negative thoughts will keep appearing according to the law of action and reaction. That's why, instead of fighting them, you should retreat from them artificially developing positive thoughts inside yourself. In other words, you should focus on or recall something good. Only in this smooth withdrawal will you be able to defeat your negative thought. And why can thoughts sometimes be the absolute opposite of each other? Sometimes I too get confused by my thoughts. Let's put it this way. In the human body, there is a spiritual nature or soul and a material nature, or an animal, beastly one, call it as you wish. The human mind is a battlefield of these two natures. That's why different thoughts arise in you. And who am I then if thoughts are extraneous? Not extraneous, but yours. You are the one who listens to them. And which nature you give preference to, that's who you will become. If you prefer the material, animal nature, you'll be evil and nasty. Whereas if you listen to the advice of your soul, you'll be a good person and it will be pleasant for other people to be around you. The choice is always yours, whether to be a tyrant or a saint. And why did my fascination with taming my anger lead to, sort of pride, to the growth of megalomania? I seem to have done a good deed, but the thought went in a different direction, I asked. You turned towards the soul and your wish was fulfilled. But when you weakened your control over yourself, you were pulled over by the animal nature, imperceptibly for you at that, through your own favorite egoistic thoughts. You enjoyed being praised by everyone for being so smart, so sensible, and so on. Inside you, the two natures are constantly waging war over you. And your future depends on which side you choose. I pondered a little and then elaborated. In other words, that trickster who reminded me of the pain and prevented me from concentrating, who inflated my megalomania. Absolutely correct. But there is a whole pile of those thoughts there. Yes, confirmed Sensei. An entire legion. That is why it's impossible to fight them. It's not Kung Fu, it's much more serious. It is possible to fight someone who offers resistance. But fighting a vacuum is pointless. The only option against a vacuum of negative thoughts is to create a similar vacuum of positive thoughts. In other words, as I said before, you should switch to something positive and think about good things. But always stay vigilant and listen to what your brain is thinking about. Observe yourself. Be aware of the fact that you're not making any effort, but thoughts are swarming in you all the time. And not just one thought. There may be two, three, or even more at once. It's like they say in Christianity that a devil is sitting on man's left shoulder while an angel is sitting on the right one. And they are always whispering something, remarked Volodya. Absolutely correct, confirmed Sensei. But for some reason, the devil whispers louder. He probably has a rougher voice. What is called the devil in Christianity is actually the manifestation of our animal nature. When I discovered this division of thoughts in myself, 
I thought I might be schizophrenic, because that also has to do with the splitting of consciousness, my persona said even more bravely. Sensei smiled and jokingly answered, Every genius has symptoms of madness. Nikolai Andreevich laughed. Yes, indeed. I observe something similar in myself as well. Stas joined the conversation, reflecting aloud about his experience. Well, if the mind is a battlefield of the two natures, and as far as I understand, their weapons are thoughts, then how can we distinguish who is who? How do the spiritual and the animal natures manifest in thoughts? In what way? The spiritual nature is thoughts generated by the power of love, in the broad sense of the word, while the animal nature is thoughts about our body, our instincts, our reflexes, megalomania, desires which are entirely consumed by material interests, and so on. Well, then we should live in a cave, Ruslan expressed his opinion, so that we have nothing and want nothing. With a cabbage head like yours, even a cave won't help, Zhenya teased him. Nobody forbids you to have all of that, continued Sensei. If you want to, go ahead, keep up with the times, and use all the benefits of civilization. But to live just for that, to regard the accumulation of material goods as the main purpose of your existence on earth is stupid. It's unnatural for the spiritual nature. Such a goal is an indicator of the predominance of the animal nature in a person. At the same time, it doesn't mean that you should live in a cave like a bum. No, I once told you that all this high technology is given to mankind so that humans could free up more time for their spiritual development. But certainly not for a man to collect a pile of this metalware at home and inflate his megalomania because he possesses all that dust. After staying silent for a while, Sensei thoughtfully said, A human is a complex synthesis of the spiritual and the animal natures. It's a pity that animal nature prevails in your mind over the one from God. I was thinking the other day and decided to give you an ancient practice to help you balance these two natures so that the animal wouldn't burden you that much. This spiritual practice has existed just as long as humans have. It is used not only for working on oneself, on one's thoughts, but also what is very important, for awakening one's soul. In relation to life, it may be compared to a dynamic meditation because it's an ongoing practice, regardless of where a person is and what he is doing. A part of the person is always in this state, controlling everything that is happening around and inside. This spiritual practice is called the lotus flower. The essence of it is as follows. A person imagines that he is planting a lotus seed inside himself, in the solar plexus area, and this small seed grows in him owing to the power of love, generated by his positive thoughts. Thus, controlling the growth of this flower, a person artificially gets rid of negative thoughts that are constantly spinning in his head. Do we really think about negative things all the time? Ruslan asked. Of course, answered Sensei. Just observe yourselves carefully. A person devotes a lot of time to visualizing various conflict situations, recalling something negative from the past, Imagining himself quarreling with someone, proving something to someone, deceiving someone, or fighting back. He thinks of his illnesses, his material deprivation, and so on. It means he always keeps a negative way of thinking. Whereas, by doing this practice, a person intentionally, under inner control, gets rid of all these negative thoughts. And the more he keeps a positive way of thinking, the quicker this seed of love grows in him. In the beginning, a person imagines that the seed starts growing and a small stalk appears. Then it begins to grow, leaves appear on the stalk, then a small flower bud emerges. And finally, nourished with more and more of the power of love, the bud blossoms into a lotus. At first, the lotus is of a golden color, but as it grows, it becomes dazzling white. How much time does it take for it to grow? I asked. Actually, it's different for everyone. Some people need years, others need months, still others need days, while some will need only moments. It all depends on a person's desire and the effort he makes. One has to not just grow this flower, but also to support it with the power of one's love so that it doesn't wither or perish. 
this constant feeling of nurturing should be held at the level of your subconsciousness. Or, to be more precise, at the level of controllable remote consciousness. The more love you give to this little flower, the more you cherish it in your thoughts, take care of it, and protect it from surrounding negative influence, the more the flower grows. This flower is nourished by the energy of love, I emphasize, by the inner energy of love. And the more a person is in the state of love for the whole world, for everyone and everything around him, the bigger the flower becomes. Whereas if he starts getting angry, the flower gets weaker. If he yields to rage, the flower withers and becomes ill. Then it is necessary to do one's best to restore it. It is a kind of control. Thus, when this flower blossoms and begins to increase in size, it starts emitting vibrations instead of a scent. The so-called leptins or gravitons, call them as you like, that is, the energy of love. A person feels the moving petals of this flower that bring vibrations to his entire body, to all the space around him, emanating love and harmony into the world. Is this felt at the physical level in any way? Genya asked. Yes. The lotus can be felt as a kind of burning in the solar plexus area, as a spreading warmth. That is, these sensations arise in the solar plexus area where, as legends say, our soul is located. From this area, warmth begins to radiate. The whole point is that wherever you are, whoever you are with, or whatever you do or think about, you should always feel this warmth, this heat that warms not only your body, but also your soul. This internal concentration of love is contained in the flower itself. Eventually, the more you take care of it and glorify this love, the more you feel this flower expanding and surrounding your body with its petals entirely, until you are inside of a huge lotus. And then a very important thing takes place. When you reach the stage where lotus petals surround you from all sides, you feel two flowers. One is inside, under your heart, and it warms you all the time with the feeling of inner love. Another one, the bigger one, is like an astral shell of this flower that surrounds you. On the one hand, it emanates the vibration of love into the world, and on the other hand, it protects you from the negative influence of other people. Thus, the law of cause and effect is at work here. Speaking the language of physics, there is a wave connection. To put it simply, you emanate waves of the good, intensifying them through your soul manifold and thus creating a blissful wave field. This force field, which you constantly feel and support with every fiber of your love, at the same time positively influences not only yourself, but also the world around you. What happens when you do this practice every day? First, you constantly control your thoughts, learning to focus on positive things. Therefore, you are automatically unable to wish anything bad to anyone or to be bad because this practice is done every day, every second, and for the rest of one's life. It is sort of a distraction method, as it's impossible to fight negative thoughts by force. Love cannot be forced. Therefore, you need to distract yourself. If a negative or undesirable thought comes, you focus on your flower and start giving your love to it. That is, you artificially forget about everything negative, or you switch your attention to something else, to something positive. But you feel the flower all the time, when you are going to bed, getting up, at night, during the day, whatever you do, when studying, working, doing sports, and so on. You feel love flaring up inside, the currents of love moving in your chest and filling your body. You feel this flower starting to heat you up from within with a special warmth, the divine warmth of love. And the more you give it, the more love emerges in you. Constantly emanating this love, you already perceive people from the perspective of love. So, secondly, what is very important is that you tune yourself to the frequency of the good. While the good means success, luck, and health, it means everything. Your mood improves, which has a positive impact on your psyche. After all, the central nervous system is the main regulator of all life activity. Therefore, first of all, this practice improves your health. Besides, your life becomes smoother because you find reconciliation with everyone. Nobody wants to quarrel with you. You are welcomed everywhere. You don't have any major problems. Why? Because even if something happens in your life, after all, life is life. 
you start perceiving those events in a completely different way than ordinary people do. You already have a new vision of life, which helps you to find the most optimal solution in a given situation because the wisdom of life awakens in you. And thirdly, and most importantly, your soul awakens within you and you start feeling that you are a human. You come to understand what God is, that God is an omnipresent substance and not a figment of imagination of a few idiots. You start feeling the divine presence in yourself and strengthen this power with your positive thoughts and feelings. You no longer feel alone in this world because God is in you and with you. You feel his real presence. There is an expression. He who is in love is in God and God is in him for God is love. It is also very important that you start feeling the aura of the flower that is inside and outside of you. How is this aura felt around the body? Stas asked. With time, you see this vibration around you as a slight glow. The air seems to become brighter and more transparent, and the surrounding world turns more intense in its colors. The most fascinating thing is that people start noticing these transformations in you. There is a common expression, a person glows, he shines. That actually means the glow of this wave field generated by the love of a person himself. People around him also start feeling this field. They are happy when that person is around, as they also start feeling joy and inner excitement. Many people recover from illness. They feel better just because of his presence, no matter how sick they have been. Everyone reaches out for that person, opening their souls to him. This means that people feel love. This is an open gate of the heart on the path to God. This is what all the great ones said and what Jesus meant when he said, let God into your heart. This spiritual practice of lotus has been used since time immemorial. Since olden times, it was said that lotus begets gods, that God awakens in the lotus. That is, in the understanding that a divine essence, a soul, awakens in the lotus flower in harmony and love inside of you because you always take care of your flower and constantly control your thoughts and feelings so that the lotus flower doesn't fade. Is a real flower actually growing there? Slava asked with surprise. No, no material flower exists there, of course. It is sort of a work of imagination. This process may be called differently, the awakening of divine love, the attainment of enlightenment, full unity with God, moksha tao shinto, call it what you like. But all of this is just words and religion. While in fact, what happens is that with your positive thoughts and feeling of love, you create a certain force field that on the one hand, influences the reality around you and on the other hand, changes the internal frequency of perception of your mind. And what about the soul? I asked. The soul is the real you. It is kind of an eternal generator of divine power, if you will but it needs to be activated by your constant thoughts of love. Someday I will tell you about the soul and its purpose in more detail. That's when Kostya joined the conversation. You said that this practice is very ancient. How old is it? I've already told you that it has existed as long as people have existed as conscious beings. Well, how long? Seven or 10,000 years? You are taking too short a time frame. Mankind in its civilized form has existed before, more than once, with even much more advanced technologies than nowadays. Why those civilizations disappeared is a different subject. One day, I will tell you about that too. But if this practice is so ancient, there should at least be some legends about it in our civilization. Certainly, the fact that the spiritual practice of the lotus flower existed in the past has been proven by numerous ancient sources. The lotus was given, for example, to some pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And if you look through the literature on this topic, you will find evidence that Egyptian myths and legends say that even their sun god, Ra, was born out of a lotus flower. This flower served as a throne for Isis, Horus, and Osiris. In the ancient Vedas, the oldest Hindu books written in Sanskrit Lotus is also one of the central themes. In particular, regarding the three principal male incarnations of God, Brahma creator, Vishnu protector, and Shiva destroyer. The following is also mentioned. 
a giant golden lotus with the lotus-born Brahma creator on it, emerged from the body of the god Vishnu. The golden thousand-petaled lotus was growing, and the universe was growing along with it. In China and India, this flower still embodies purity and chastity. People associated the best human qualities and aspirations with the lotus. In China, it is believed that there is a lotus lake in a special Western heaven, and every flower growing there is bound to the soul of a deceased person. If an individual was virtuous, his flower blossoms, otherwise the flower wilts. In Greece, a lotus is considered to be a plant devoted to goddess Hera. Hercules made one of his voyages in a lotus-shaped golden sunboat. But all these are legends and myths which, however, are not so made up. These stories were based on real facts of people's self-development thanks to this ancient spiritual practice. It's just that earlier, when the animal nature prevailed in most people, the lotus flower was given only to the chosen ones, to more or less spiritually mature individuals. It is natural that other people later regarded those individuals as gods, since the one who has grown a lotus, who has awakened the soul in himself, really becomes godlike as he creates in love by mere thought. When the time came to spiritually enlighten most people, the bodhisattvas of Shambhala gave this spiritual practice to Buddha. It is because he practiced this technique of the lotus that Siddhartha Gautama attained enlightenment while sitting under the Bodhi tree. With the permission of Rigdon, Buddha gave it to his disciples for further spreading among people. Unfortunately, over time, people distorted Buddha's teaching and created a whole religion based on this spiritual practice. It resulted in a situation when even Buddhists practicing their religion now imagine their paradise as an unusual place where people are born like gods on a lotus flower. They are looking for this place, although it is always inside of them. They made a god out of Buddha too, even though he was just a human who had known the truth thanks to this spiritual practice. That's why a lotus became the symbol of Buddhism and also an expression appeared, Buddha is sitting in a lotus or Buddha is standing in a lotus. He has simply shown to people by his example what a human can attain by overcoming his animal nature. He really made a great contribution to the spiritual development of humankind by spreading this spiritual practice among people in its original form. A similar prayer to awaken divine love was given by Jesus Christ. Do you mean that prayer and meditation are the same thing? Tatiana asked. Basically, they are. The prayer our Father given by Jesus is the same thing. It is just that everything is too mundane there. People ask for bread and so on, but the main meaning is the same. A person spiritually develops himself, nurtures the soul inside him by controlling thoughts, by his desire, unwavering faith and love. In general, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and all the great ones knew this spiritual practice as they used the same source. It helped them not only to become themselves, but also to help other people explore their divine nature. Why was it so pleasant for everyone to be near Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad? Why is it said that holy people shine? Why are we sometimes unwilling to leave complete strangers upon meeting them? Because they emanate this love. Because they always increase this power. The power of the good. The power of love the power of this divine manifestation in a human. People say about such individuals that God is in them, and this is really true. So, does it mean that we should just think with love about this flower? Andre asked. No, you should not just concentrate and think of it, but most importantly, evoke this sensation of warmth in the solar plexus area and constantly support it with your positive thoughts. A lot of people might not succeed right away, because one should get to the bottom of it all, imagine it more realistically, and, I repeat, evoke all these sensations. Why do I focus your attention on this? Because when a person evokes these sensations, he starts supporting them not just with his mind, but also at the level of his sub-mind, or to be more precise, subconsciousness. This leads to awakening of the soul. It just can't help but awaken. And the more you nourish it with your love, the more it will awaken, and the more you will become yourself, the one who you are inside eternally, and not in your external mortal bodily shell.
After keeping silent for a while, Sensei added, Life is too short, and you should use your time to glorify the spiritual essence in your heart. Our entire mixed age group stood silent, deep in thought about Sensei's words. I even felt some kind of a tingling sensation in my body from a sudden overwhelming inspiration and delight. I was so amazed by everything I had heard, so shocked by this unexpected information, that it was hard for me to believe that these words were spoken by an ordinary man. I had a feeling that his knowledge, so deep from my point of view, was evidently not of this world. I wanted to ask about this, but something was holding me back. I suspected that this something already knew about everything because it was reaching out for this being with every fiber of my soul. But as soon as I thought about this, my mind started to argue with me again, assuring me that Sensei was an ordinary, simple man, just very knowledgeable and thoroughly versed in philosophy, religion, psychology, history, physiology, medicine, and physics. Stop. What am I doing? I thought. Is it really possible for a human to hold so much fundamental knowledge inside him all at once? But on the other hand, why not? Gifted people do exist, such as Lomonosov, or Leonardo da Vinci, whose knowledge was actually far ahead of his time. However, I don't seem to remember them speaking so clearly about the soul. Besides, why am I racking my brain wondering who he really is? The main thing is that I received answers to the questions that bothered me and found what I had been seeking for so long. It's true, as they say, the one who seeks will always find. I was sincerely happy like a child. That's exactly what I need. This is the way to reach that edge of eternity from where the great ones contemplate. This is my only chance, my only saving straw. It's not even a straw, it's an entire saving arc in which even physical death is not to be feared, and in which it's not scary to sail into eternity. Any more questions? Sensei asked. We kept silent, looking at him with admiring eyes. Only Nikolai Andreevich, who was a more or less sober-minded person in our group, replied, Well, let's say, I surely don't believe in God. But from the perspective of psychology, this is quite an interesting option. Everything needs to be pondered over. There is a lot of information, and I need to sort it all out. Questions will come later. All righty then, the teacher answered genially. Perhaps that's enough for today. Let's go home. Chapter 21 I was in an excellent mood. All the way home, I analyzed what I had heard, reviewing it in my thoughts from various perspectives. Then I began to examine my good mood. Something was definitely off because I felt as if I were completely healthy. Analyzing my impressions for a while, I suddenly realized what it was. Previously, I had thought that my soul, meaning my inner self, which is supposed to leave for eternity, was located in my material brain and it seemed to me that I was thinking with it, and that all my thoughts originated from it. However, lately I had been having serious problems with my brain, as the doctor said. That depressed me not so much physically as spiritually. I believed that if my brain was damaged, hence my soul might malfunction as well. I couldn't wait to get home and plant my little seed. Of course, Sensei said that one can do this spiritual practice anywhere, but I decided to start this noble deed at home in peace and quiet. I came home, quickly finished all my petty tasks, and when my parents settled down to watch TV, I got comfortable in the lotus pose. The long-awaited time had finally come. Concentrating, my persona thought, let's start with the planting. But then I panicked a little bit. Firstly, I didn't know what a lotus seed looked like. I had once seen this flower in a book, but I'd never seen its seeds. Plus, I didn't know what this planting would look like and where exactly I should plant the seed. I had seen how seeds sprouted in the soil. But for some reason that didn't satisfy me because soil, even an imaginary one in the soul, somehow didn't match my notion of eternity. Reflecting on it a little, I found an acceptable solution. Once I had seen my mother germinating kidney beans by placing them in wet cotton wool. I liked this option. Let it be a bean, my persona thought. After all, it's my imagination, and the main thing is the essence itself, as Sensei said. 
Having focused once again, I began to imagine placing a small white bean inside of myself, in the solar plexus area, immersing it into something soft and warm. After that, I started uttering affectionate words inwardly, nursing my little seed. Yet, no sensations followed. So, I began to recall all the good words I knew. At that point, my persona was astonished to discover that I knew far fewer good and beautiful words than bad and cursing ones, since the latter heard everywhere on the street and at school were much more likely to add to my vocabulary. My thoughts, again imperceptibly, switched to mulling over some conclusions, logically following each other. Realizing this, I focused on the flower again, but nothing happened. After about 20 minutes of fruitless efforts, my persona thought that I was probably doing something wrong. Finally, I went to bed, having decided to ask Sensei more about my mistakes later. However, I couldn't fall asleep. Darkness covered everything around me. Objects and furniture in the room lost their natural colors. A thought came to my mind. Our world is actually so illusory. It just seems to us that we really live. While in fact, we are like children inventing a game for ourselves and playing it. But unlike children, adults do not grow up because they get so used to a created image that they begin to think that everything else is the same kind of reality. And in this way, our entire life passes in falsehood and bustle. Although, as Sensei said, the real you is the soul, that eternal reality which actually exists. You just need to wake up, to awaken from illusion, and then the whole world will change. As I went deeper into contemplation of the eternal, I began to feel kind of nice and light. And then I suddenly felt something warming up in my chest and tickling pleasantly. Shivers started running all over my body from my tailbone to the back of my head. Such a pleasant and peaceful state came over me that I wanted to embrace the entire world with my soul. In such a sweet slumber, I fell asleep. I slept as if in a fairy tale, because when I woke up in the morning, I felt such inspiration and lightness as I had never experienced in my life. At school, I tried to mentally evoke my previous day's state again, but I couldn't really concentrate because of a constant whirlwind of school information and contradictory emotions. I succeeded only during the literature class when the teacher was monotonously explaining a new topic. Half of the class were pretending to listen to her with bleary eyes, while the other half tried to fight off sleep. In the meantime, I concentrated on my solar plexus area again, focusing all of my attention on evoking a sensation of warmth and a state of joy. My good thoughts were floating somewhere in the background of my mind. The main thing for me was what was taking place inside. I felt good, my body somehow relaxed, and in my chest, I started feeling a slight pressure that was turning into warmth. After that, I was simply sitting, enjoying this state, and continued listening to the new topic. By the way, a few days later, I discovered that from that moment on, I remembered everything the teacher had told us clearly, without any strain. This was a very good revelation for my consciousness. After school classes, I ran into the library to fill the gap in my knowledge about the lotus flower. Yet, what I read about it in various sources really amazed me. I found out the following. A lotus is a water-resistant perennial herbaceous plant with a long stalk and large flowers, reaching 30 centimeters in diameter and resting upon big leaves. Lotus leaves have an interesting peculiarity. They are covered with a special waxy film and therefore do not get wet in the water. I interpreted this statement to mean that the soul cannot be stained with bad thoughts, or in other words, with the influence of animal nature the soul will just keep sleeping. A lotus flower has 22 to 30 petals, faintly pink at the foundation and bright at the top, located spirally around the seed pod. I glanced at the photo of the flower. This seed pod, located in the center of the flower, looked similar to a golden cork with multiple fibers of the same color around it. Interestingly enough, lotus flowers always face the sun. A lotus has the so-called reaction zone that catches the light and is located a little lower than the point where the flower is attached to the stalk. As for lotus seeds, I read even more stunning information about them. 
Lotus seeds possess an extraordinary ability to retain their germinating power for a few hundred, and sometimes even a few thousand, years. This peculiarity of the lotus is probably the reason it has been used from time immemorial as a symbol of immortality and resurrection. Also, I managed to discover one more interesting detail. Lotus possesses homeothermic ability, which means that the flower is able to maintain its internal temperature just like birds, mammals, and people do. The lotus flower plays a significant role in the beliefs of different peoples. That was all I managed to find out, but this was enough to partially grasp the meaning of why the art of lotus, constantly mentioned by sensei, is named in honor of this flower. However, I felt a complete understanding of this meaning somewhere inside, in the very depth of my true self. Chapter 22 A few days later, on our way to the training, the guys started sharing their impressions and results. It turned out that everyone had understood sensei in their own way, so everyone grew inner love differently. Kostya imagined that he planted a lotus seed into some kind of a life-giving substance of the universe, as he called it. Moreover, he did it just the day before, whereas earlier, he had been zealously searching through the literature and looking for proof of sensei's words. He didn't have any sensations, he had simply imagined the process and was now waiting for a result. Tatiana imagined this love as the birth of Jesus in her heart since she had been brought up as a faithful Christian by her grandmother. She had a feeling of happiness, inner delight, warmth and light pressure in the area of her heart, but her heart started aching a little. Andre purposefully focused on the solar plexus area this whole time in order to achieve at least some kind of sensations by thinking about his lotus. Only on the third day did he feel a barely noticeable slight warmth and not even warmth, but as if something was tickling in that place like from a touch of a feather. As for Slava, he couldn't even imagine how all of that could occur inside of his organs. Before the beginning of the training session, our group waited for a time when Sensei wasn't busy and approached him with questions. We started telling him about our experiences. Tatiana got in, as they say, out of turn, complaining to Sensei about her heart. The teacher took her hand and felt her pulse like a professional doctor. Yes, you have tachycardia. What happened? I don't know. It started aching after I had focused on the birth of Lord in my heart. Then she told in more detail about the awakening of her divine love. I see, responded Sensei. You focused on your heart as the organ, but you mustn't focus on the organ. A heart is a heart. It is merely a muscle, a pump of the body. By focusing on it, you put it off its rhythm and interfere in its work. Only when you learn to control yourself will you be able to focus on the work of your body and its organs. By doing that now, you will only harm yourself. You should focus specifically on the solar plexus. Everything originates from there. That's the main chakra in the lotus practice, and it is called kundalini. I've read that when kundalini awakens, some kind of a snake crawls up one's spine. Kostya flaunted his erudition. That definition comes from yoga, answered the teacher. It's typical for people to confuse everything over time. Whereas originally, in the lotus practice, kundalini is a chakra located in the solar plexus area. Let me repeat that what I told you about the lotus flower is just images, nothing more, to make it easier for you to understand, perceive, and feel it deeply. Still, what does it actually look like overall? Please tell us one more time, just for dummies, so to say, Andre asked with humor. It is when you simply feel vibrations, the inner power of love growing. Let's say... It's a feeling as if you're anticipating something very, very good. For instance, you are waiting for a huge, long-awaited present you have been dreaming about. And now you receive it. You are happy. You're overfilled with gratitude. You even feel tingling all over your body. In other words, you have this feeling in the solar plexus area, as if something beautiful and nice emanates from you or you are awaiting it. That's the feeling you should have which you evoke artificially and constantly maintain in the solar plexus area. Eventually, it becomes natural for you, and people begin to feel it. In other words, you radiate this joy, and that's all. 
it doesn't necessarily have to be a flower or something else. These are just images for easier perception. Regarding the flower that will surround the body, how does that work? Well, are you familiar with such notions as the astral, mental, and other energy bodies? Or simply put, the multi-layer aura around a human? Yes. So, when this force field of goodness expands in you, you have a sensation of multiple layers of petals. You feel that you are cocooned and protected. You're blossoming in the lotus. At the same time, you feel that you're like the sun over the world. You warm everything with the heat of your great love. This is a continuous meditation. Wherever you are and whatever you do, you evoke these fibers, these sensations, these flows of energies. The point is that the more you practice, the more powerful they become. Ultimately, this process gains material characteristics, and you will really be able to have a positive influence on people. I mean, you'll be able to do it when you yourself change completely, both internally in thoughts and externally in actions. Andre wanted to ask another question, but a lanky old man appeared in the gym doorway. All right, guys, Sensei said before Andre voiced his question. We will discuss it later. We moved aside. The old man greeted Sensei and started speaking with excitement, drawing him aside. You know, the academician called me from Leningrad today, he said out of breath. George Ivanovich. He asked me to tell you that he will definitely come here in three days. I didn't quite catch the words that followed, because the lanky overcame his excitement and switched to a softer voice. My persona was extremely surprised by this message. What does an academician need here? From Leningrad at that? What does he need sensei for? I was full of curiosity. But then the training session began, which sensei entrusted the senior senpai to lead. I could no longer think about satisfying curiosity. During the training, after practicing Sensei's figurative analogy of waiting for a big present, I felt that these sensations worked a lot better for me because I remembered them well from my childhood. As soon as I revived those long-forgotten feelings in my memory, I felt a pleasant tickling in the center of my solar plexus, spreading in various directions with light wavy streams. It was a really nice and joyful feeling at that moment but I couldn't keep such a state even for a minute and it disappeared by itself. My attempts to revive and to evoke these sensations again took up a lot more time than I wanted. Thus, preoccupied with my internal state, I didn't notice how the training flew by. By the way, my body was no longer aching from that memorable training session and the pain had gone away in exactly three days, just as Sensei said. Chapter 23 In the days that followed, I tried to evoke these sensations while doing various things, but it worked well only when I focused specifically on the lotus flower while doing some kind of physical activity. Moreover, I began to keep track of my thoughts at least a little bit. One day, when sitting at home and doing homework, I tried to recall everything I had thought about that day. However, I was unable to recall not just my thoughts, but even all of my actions. Everything was kind of general, whereas details surfaced with difficulty. Most importantly, good deeds were perceived as, that's the way it should be, and I barely remembered them. Meanwhile, negative moments and negative emotional surges were engraved in my memory down to the slightest detail. That's when, as they say, I consciously felt the power of the animal nature firsthand. Sensei's words came to my mind of their own accord. A thought is material because it is generated in the material brain. Therefore, a bad thought oppresses. It is the first guard that always tries to defeat a human. Someday, I will tell you about it in more detail, about how your thoughts emerge and why their power over you is so strong. I thought, why doesn't Sensei tell us everything at once, postponing it all to an indefinite later? For some of us, that later may never even come. But on the other hand, my perception of his words now is completely different from the way I perceived them at the initial training sessions. Previously, I simply listened, and only now have I started to understand some things because I began to practice and work on myself. I already have some results and experience. Therefore, I now have concrete questions. And when it comes to concrete questions, 
Sensei always gives concrete answers. Suddenly, it dawned on me. He is simply waiting for us to understand his words, to digest them, so to speak. He is waiting for our mind to comprehend everything on its own and take the side of the soul. Otherwise, as Sensei says, all this valuable knowledge will remain for us an empty ringing in an empty head. Sensei said that we should constantly work on ourselves, that every minute of life is precious, and we should use it as God's gift for perfecting our souls. These words gave me confidence and optimism. Later on, I often recalled them when my body was overcome with apathy. Chapter 24 Despite bad weather and traffic problems caused by the first snow which piled up this year like never before, everybody arrived at the meditation class on time. Without wasting time, Sensei began to discuss our attempts to grow the lotus flower. Nikolai Andreevich was delighted with his results, in particular from the psychotherapeutic point of view, as one of the best ways to control thoughts. At the end of his story, he said thoughtfully, I was trying to analyze everything you said in more detail, and a question came up. You said that these vibrations of love protect a human from the negative influence of other people. From which influence exactly? And what does that look like? Negative influence can be diverse. It can be an evil eye, a jinx, as people call it, or a hex. An evil eye? A jinx? Nikolai Andreevich was sincerely surprised. I thought that evil eyes and jinxes were just folklore, and quite a profitable one for a certain category of enterprising people. This folklore actually exists because the phenomenon of thought really is present in nature, but doesn't have sufficient solid scientific confirmation yet. As a matter of fact, manifestation of negative thoughts does exist. I've already said many times that a thought is material. They're trying to prove it now with modern means. And as time goes on, they will find more and more scientific proof. A thought is an information wave. Its information is encoded at a certain frequency, which is perceived by our material brain, or rather, by its deeper structures. When someone thinks something bad about you, it's natural that it is detected by your brain at the subconscious level. Upon deciphering this code, your brain begins to model this negative situation in you which is later implemented in reality as an unconscious command of subconsciousness. That's actually a jinx, which manifests itself in a form of illness or something else. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, if an individual creates a wave field with certain frequency characteristics around himself, to put it simply, an aura of love, then, by all the laws of physics, negative information cannot penetrate into this force field not to mention reach your brain and manifest there as a command. Why? Because this force field is much more powerful. A human as a social unit is a pretty complex structure. He exchanges information with others not just by means of facial expressions, gestures, and voice. Even if we consider voice, what is it, basically? It is that very vibration that we hear in the audible range of waves, just at different frequencies than those at which thoughts are perceived. So it means that our ability to perceive sounds is limited only by sort of an illusion of consciousness? Nikolai Andreevich said out loud, thinking about something else. Of course. For example, science has officially proven that a human is limited in frequency range and only hears in the range from 20 hertz to 18 kilohertz. But for some reason, when people discovered the world of ultrasounds, they learn to communicate with dolphins. This proves once again that a human consciously perceives just a small part of the diverse world around him. Meanwhile, his subconsciousness detects much more from the surrounding world. Does a human feel it in some way? Stas asked. He does. It's just that an ordinary human feels it at the intuitive level, with a sixth sense, as people say, while a more spiritually developed personality perceives it more consciously. By forming in himself a force field made of vibrations of love, a person becomes invulnerable to negative information flows, putting it simply to bad thoughts. Hence, he is not distracted by the fight inside himself and doesn't waste his precious time and power on it. How does that manifest itself in one's life? After all, it doesn't always go so smoothly. Sometimes there are streaks of bad and good luck. 
Victor inquired. Streaks of bad and good luck exist only in your consciousness. You yourself have created it in your imagination. When everything is wonderful in your life, you subconsciously expect something bad and negative to happen. And since you predispose yourself to it, you eventually get it. It is us who invented such a game for ourselves, to our own misfortune. There is no such thing in nature. If your life is good, it is good. If it is crappy, then you are the fool. That's for sure. The guy smiled upon hearing such a conclusive answer. Can this spiritual practice help a person cleanse himself from, well, Zhenya faltered a little bit, seeking the right words. From sin, so to say. I mean, from the bad things he's already done in his life. Of course, a person, as you say, cleanses himself from sin because not only does he repent what he has done in his life, but most importantly, he no longer does it and doesn't want to do it again because those deeds become foreign to him. He simply casts aside everything negative, forgetting it at the level of subconsciousness and consciousness. If he is oppressed by some past deeds that are constantly gnawing at him, he automatically cleanses himself with the help of the growing power of love, working on the awakening of his soul. Why is it said that sin will destroy you? Andre asked. Yes, it will destroy you. If a person has done something bad, this action doesn't let him rest at the level of subconsciousness and consciousness. It gnaws at his brain like a worm. Eventually, it comes out in the form of an ulcer, a heart attack, a stroke, and so on. In other words, whatever way you look at it, if nothing is done to stop it, this bad thing kills the person from inside. And how can a person understand whether he's done a good or a bad thing? Everyone understands pretty well which of their deeds were good and which were bad. No matter how much a person swaggers, no matter how he shows off to others how cool or good he is and what a superman he is, in reality, when he is left one-on-one -on -one with himself, he's afraid for himself. He's afraid when he goes to bed at night, especially if he is alone or when he's walking along a dark path. He clearly feels that someone is watching him. He feels this gaze on himself and it weighs on him. He is afraid of death because there he will feel, well, to put it mildly, he'll be screwed. What will happen there after death? Asked Stas. For the one who is good, let's say, who is pure, who has God inside, that one has nothing to be afraid of, he will feel good there as well. Even if he hasn't achieved major success in spiritual development, even if he failed to attain the ultimate freedom of his soul, putting it simply, hasn't united with eternal love, with God or nirvana, call it as you wish, or hasn't got to heaven or the kingdom of God in the interpretation of religions. But he was developing his soul. He was striving for that. Heaven is not a place where you physically hang out with your friends who are like you, who pray in church because it's fashionable and consider themselves enlightened. All this is rubbish, even if you pray like that your whole life. The main thing is not what you show off to the outside world, but what you think and do. The main thing is who you really are and how you educate yourself, how you pursue your spiritual growth. If you have attained a certain level of freedom, when you come to God as a mature child, this is a really valuable achievement. This is the main goal that is attracting you. You have left, you are free. Stars are in front of you and the infinity of perfection awaits you ahead. But this state is even difficult for you to understand. Whereas if you're a bad and negative fellow, let's say, if material nature predominates in you, if you try to obtain material benefits for yourself by oppressing others, that is, by harming them, and at the same time you don't make any attempts to improve yourself, you will feel quite bad there. Ah, you can bribe priests in the name of God and they will forgive all your sins at once, Zhenya tried to joke. Priests might forgive you, but the Lord will not. By and large, if you try to give a measly ransom, even by building a church, but do not repent for what you've done and do not start living with your conscience differently. All your recompenses will be meaningless and foolish because the Lord is more interested in the growth of your soul, that is, of his particle, than in any recompenses in the form of material goods that were created by his own will for the development and testing of human souls. What do you mean by saying that one will feel quite bad there? Andre asked. Well, it's hard to explain so that you understand, but approximately something like this. 
Imagine the most heinous and horrible thing that can happen to you. Have you imagined it? We have. So, that's the best that you will have there, and for a pretty long time. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you how things really are. Every human is responsible for his actions. He may have no idea that he is responsible, although at the level of subconsciousness, he is perfectly aware of what he is doing. He is secretly self-serving, dominated by his material self. He steals, lies, satisfies his megalomania. He doesn't want to give a penny or he thinks, I have a lot of money, I'm a king. What kind of a king are you? Tomorrow you will die, and there they will look at who you are. And the most interesting thing is that everyone feels and understands this. That's why many people thrash about all their life, like pendulums, from one extreme to another, from one religion to another. But in reality, nobody except yourselves will ever atone for your sins. What is needed is your real actions in respect to your inner world. There has to be real maturity of your soul and not some elusive self-delusions and foolish hope that no one will find out what you've done and you'll get away with it. The guard who records all your thoughts, not to mention your actions, is inside of you, and the subsequent destiny of your soul will be determined exactly according to his memory tablets. So that means it's bad to be rich, Slava made a conclusion of his own. No, being rich is good, it is great. However, the fact that we still have poor people, that is bad and sad. When people are rich, it is wonderful. They have time for themselves, for their development, if they use it the right way, of course. Please tell me, Nikolai Andreevich joined the conversation again. Regarding the lotus flower, I'd like to find out, do all people perceive these vibrations of love positively? A vast majority do, but there are certain individuals who perceive these vibrations of love extremely negatively. It alarms and repulses them. It means that their consciousness is defective. In order to prevent their soul from awakening upon coming into contact with emanations of such a person, their mind becomes active and negativity arises in it. This means that an individual who reacts this way is very bad and nasty, although he may think that he is wonderful and good. He may be extolled by a whole bunch of people, while in reality he's a scumbag. Why? Because he reacts to all of this extremely negatively. The animal nature prevails over the soul in his mind. We were silent for a while. You know, recently I came across a record in literature that Helena Blavatsky had mentioned in her manuscripts a special spiritual practice, which she called the Rose of the World, and which very remotely resembles the lotus flower. Kostya bragged about his discovery. Right, it's an echo of the lotus flower spiritual practice. However, Blavatsky brought a lot of confusion to it, and that's not surprising because she wrote about it based on the words of various lamas and not the true source. I've also read that awakening of the lotus is the highest achievement in Buddhism. But there, before achieving it, one needs to go through numerous initiations, stages, and tests. All that is rubbish. People made up all of that chaff later in order to create a free feeder for themselves. Religion. In the beginning, Buddha gave namely this simple spiritual practice of the lotus flower in its pure form for the majority of people. It was accessible to everyone and aimed at awakening one's soul. Everything was very simple. Did he give it to his disciples too? At first, he gave this spiritual practice to his disciples as well. And later, according to their level of awakening, he gave them more sophisticated knowledge. Last time, you said that Buddha's knowledge was partially lost and partially distorted. Kostya just couldn't let it go. But I've read that Dalai Lama has this knowledge and gives it to his disciples, while in Lamaism, one of the major Buddhist branches, he is the highest person among the reincarnated, an earthly incarnation of a highly respected Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara. No, that's not right. Avalokiteshvara, Kostya uttered with difficulty. He is a living god, as they say. It is also written there that the death of this living God becomes the beginning of his new earthly incarnation, and a special commission made up of the highest lamas searches for him among infants who are born in the year following the Dalai Lama's death. 
So I'm thinking, if this bodhisattva constantly reincarnates, can this knowledge really be lost? Who? Dalai Lama? A bodhisattva? He's not even fit to be a bodhisattva's shadow. Who is actually Dalai Lama in his essence? Well, for you to really understand, I'll tell you the backstory. Buddha's teaching was initially verbal. However, it had a great resonance among people because its spiritual practices were simple and easy to master, especially the lotus flower. His philosophical teaching was written down for the first time on palm leaves as the Tripitaka collection of texts in 29 BC, from the words of his followers. Just think about it. Almost 600 years after his death, it is the most ancient, early Buddhist collection of manuscripts that had already been written in a distorted version compared to the true teaching of Buddha, since its authors were people who pursued their personal goals of becoming rich through this knowledge, in particular, by establishing a religion on its basis. Moreover, after Buddha's death, a division took place between his disciples. Some of them adhered to traditional views, the so-called doctrine of Hinayana, which in Sanskrit means the small chariot, or a narrow path of salvation. In its initial form, this branch was more or less closer to the truth because it emphasized the significance of the personal efforts of a practitioner to liberate himself from the bonds of samsara, transition of the soul from one body to another, by ascending to ultimate salvation, nirvana. And still, it was severely distorted with time by people who turned it into a complicated and pompous cult. As for the other branch, Mahayana, which in Sanskrit means the great chariot or a wide path of salvation, it is actually the beginning of our story about the Dalai Lama. The doctrine of Mahayana reformed all sides of Buddhist teaching, turning Buddha from the wise man and teacher into a typical deity and the bodhisattvas into his emanations. In their understanding, anyone could become a bodhisattva by making it to the ruling clique of this religion, even though the very word bodhisattva has a completely different meaning. This word originates from Shambhala. The exact translation of the word bodhisattva from Sanskrit means the one whose essence is knowledge. Buddha introduced this concept among people, taking into account the level of spiritual development at that time. But even in his definition of that word, its meaning sounded as follows. Bodhisattva is the being of Shambhala, who reached the highest level of perfection and came out of nirvana, who has the will to immerse in it again, but refuses it because of his love and compassion for living creatures and an aspiration to help them attain perfection. So what did those fake bodhisattvas do? They removed just a few words from Buddha's definition. Shambhala came out of nirvana, who has the will, and also help them attain perfection and replace that with their own interpretation. Thus, they changed the entire meaning of the word in a way that was beneficial to them. They hoped that the world would never find out about this anyway. But this fact indicates their immeasurable stupidity in regard to true knowledge, true spiritual knowledge, no matter how much it is distorted no matter how much it is hidden and no matter how much it is destroyed, will still be conveyed to people by Shambhala in its pure form at the right time. Because Shambhala is the only crystal pure source of spiritual knowledge on earth. It's impossible for a human to become a bodhisattva, although in the history of mankind there were a few unique personalities who managed to grow with their souls to the level of bodhisattva, but those unique individuals can be counted on the fingers of one hand over the entire history of the existence of humanity, and not just over the tiny period of time which you think of as history. So, the highest level people can achieve in this spiritual field by working on themselves, I emphasize once again, by working on themselves, is to develop their soul through love, to such an extent that death won't be able to rule over them. In other words, they can liberate themselves from the chain of reincarnations and unite with divine love, with nirvana, call it as you like. For you, it's difficult to understand even the meaning of the word nirvana now. But no earthly pleasures may be compared even with a tiny fraction of that supreme state. So bodhisattvas are really beings from Shambhala? Andre asked. Yes, they created their little world there, 
known to people as the abode. Precisely from there, knowledge is given to the world, both scientific and spiritual knowledge, so that people can mature spiritually and develop their souls. Are messiahs also bodhisattvas? inquired Stas. Sometimes when giving the basic teaching, bodhisattvas have to become messiahs, but this is very rare. More often, as a rule, messiahs are their disciples brought up from ordinary people. In what sense? Well, once I will tell you about it, we have deviated from the subject too much. So, a bodhisattva will not try to prove to anyone who he is, much less create a religion. A bodhisattva may give a teaching about the spiritual essence of a human and how to develop it, but he would never give a religion. In fact, any religion is just a huge show business begotten by megalomania of a handful of people who rule it and have created it in order to fleece money from a crowd of stupid asses. Well, why stupid? Ruslan said resentfully. Because these people become very limited in their knowledge. It is constantly being drummed into their heads that they should listen only to the speeches of their religious leaders, read only their literature, and stick only to their herd since all other religions are wrong. For example, let's not go far and let's return to the subject of our conversation, to what those showmen did to Buddha's teaching. Firstly, for their own convenience and in order to have fewer questions from the crowd, they turned Buddha into a god. Secondly, they introduced complicated religious rituals, worship services, and prayers, showing the masses the wide and easy path to salvation through their show cult of mentors bodhisattvas. An ordinary layman not only has to perform the rituals, spells, vows, and all the multi-layered nonsense they invented, but he should also give them gifts for their baloney and implicitly obey them at that. To put it simply, those false bodhisattvas who were actually just sly and clever people, simply created yet another feeder, religion. And now, let's return to the Dalai Lama. So, the one who started all this mess with reforming Buddhism was Nagarjuna, who lived in the second century AD. He was a pretty smart but cunning man with self-serving interests. He was a Hindu philosopher, theologian, and poet, and he founded the school of Shunyavada, Madhyamaka, and now, the most important part, for making simple things complicated, for greatly distorting and partially appropriating the knowledge given by Buddha to the masses, for turning the essence of the very teaching upside down, Nagarjuna was severely punished by Rigdon Japo and sentenced to eternal conscious reincarnation. Who is Rigdon Japo? asked Kostya. Rigdon Japo heads the commune of bodhisattvas in Shambhala. So? Later in history, Nagarjuna's personality was known under different names. In 1391, it was his personality that was reborn in a man named Gendun Drupa, who became the first Dalai Lama. He had once wanted to be worshipped and admired for being such a great appointee. He was drawn by wealth, luxury, and worship. Now the Dalai Lama has plenty of wealth, he has plenty of luxury, and he is worshipped by a quarter of the world. But on the other hand, he's not happy and will never be. He is doomed to eternal conscious reincarnation and eternal inner suffering. He cannot leave for nirvana and cannot break free from the continuous loop of conscious rebirths. Nobody will set him free from this earthly life. Every time when he turns 13 years old in yet another of his lives, that is during puberty, when life energy awakens and a connection of a human with the cosmos is established. To put it simply, when he begins to awaken as a personality and realizes who he is, for him it causes big pain for the rest of his life. Pain? No way, Kostya blurted out. He is the Dalai Lama. He has everything. It's a happiness to have everything and to get reborn time and again. How can such a life be boring? The teacher wearily looked at Kostya and said, Well, how to explain this to you? For example, have you seen the movie White Son of the Desert? Yes. Do you remember how the customs official Vereshagin sat down to dinner and his wife served him a whole plate of black caviar? He glanced at it and said, Caviar again. I cannot eat it anymore, darn it. Can you go and exchange it for bread or something? In other words, everything becomes boring with time 
and very quickly, and life becomes three times as boring. If you had remembered at least a part of what you experienced in other bodies, you would just get sick of the monotony of bodily shells. To be reborn consciously and to know that it's your eternal fate is scary, and you can't even imagine how scary it is. It was for good reason that Jesus punished the wandering Jew with immortality. Do you remember this story? Kostya shook his head perplexedly. No. When Jesus was driven to Golgotha, he felt very bad. He was tormented by thirst. And when he stopped at the doorstep of a house of one of the Jews whose name was Ahasuerus and asked for water, the latter rudely chased him away, being afraid for his life, afraid of being punished for that. And Jesus told him, you're afraid for your life, so you will live forever. Since then, Ahasuerus cannot die and roams around the world, no matter how bored he is with that. So will he never ever be forgiven? Tatiana asked compassionately. Not until the overall forgiveness, until the entire world repents. But that's already another story. Sensei glanced at his watch. All right, guys, it's time to do meditation, otherwise our conversation might go on for a very long time. Today will be a repeat for some of you, while for others, we will try to work with foot chakrans and the hara chakran. Where are they located? Asked Stas. Foot chakrans are located in the center of your feet, while the hara chakran is three fingers below the navel, at the dan tian point. Translated from Japanese, hara means belly. It is the center of a human, which practically coincides with the center of gravity, both in the physical and the geometrical sense. This meditation, just as the previous one, is intended for concentration and focusing one's attention. Now, stand up, relax, place your feet shoulder width apart. We made ourselves comfortable, relaxed, and concentrated on performing the meditation. Now we will inhale as usual, that is, at will and exhale into the bowl-like hara, as if filling it with tsi energy until you feel a slight heaviness. When your hara fills up, you should let the tsi energy pass from hara into your legs and then through the center of your feet into the ground. For some time, I drove this energy only with my thought, but then my imagination switched to an undeniably real feeling of my belly swelling up as if water had really been poured into me. Meanwhile, Sensei reminded us, when your hara fills up, you should pour this energy out through your legs and then through the center of your feet into the ground. I tried to do it in my imagination again, mentally working on my body. Gradually, I started feeling some kind of warmth, flowing in a slight streamlet. However, it was fragmented, not continuous, and it was clearly felt in the area of my shins and especially my feet, even though it was pretty cold outside, my boot-clad feet started gradually warming up. When I noticed that, I switched to thinking about how I was doing it. Sensations disappeared somehow imperceptibly as my mind was deepening into logic. But as soon as I tried to focus again, Sensei announced that the meditation was over. Take two deep breaths in and out, clench your fists quickly and open your eyes. I looked at my watch. Only about 10 minutes had passed, but it seemed like a lot longer to me. Someone noticed that the snow had melted under us. We looked around in amazement. Indeed, under some of the senior guys, the thawed patches were about 40 centimeters in radius, while we had just regular ones under us. Genya glanced at Stas and declared, You see, and you complained. It is so cold, it would be good to be in Africa now. There's no need for you to go to Africa. Palm trees are already starting to grow under your feet. Then, addressing Sensei, he added, I suspected a long time ago that something was wrong with his origin. He's always been drawn to the Papuans. After another series of jokes, when everyone calmed down a little bit, Sensei said that we could work on this meditation on our own at home. And on the lotus flower too? Asked Kostya. Of course, Pay special attention to it and do it every chance you get. When will we see the results? Don't worry, if you aren't lazy, the results won't keep you waiting. I'm sorry, I wanted to return to the conversation we had before the meditation. You said that all scientific knowledge is given to the world by Shambhala. 
I didn't quite understand. How is it given? Nikolai Andreevich uttered with a faint note of arrogance in his voice. I always thought that a human is intelligent enough to figure out everything, including scientific discoveries on his own. Well, how to put it, by and large, a human will certainly become a perfect creature one day. But as long as the animal nature reigns in his mind, he cannot even invent an ordinary chair unless he is told how it should be made. How come? Well, elementary. It's only nowadays that people are so smart since they use the knowledge of their ancestors. But have you ever wondered how their ancestors found out about it? Even in the most ancient legends of the Sumerian civilization, written on clay tablets, it is mentioned that people from the sky told them how to organize their everyday life, how to build houses, how to fish, how to grow vegetative food for themselves, and so forth. Before that, people lived like a herd of animals. Let's take even the modern world. How do scientists make discoveries? By intensive work on a given research subject. Certainly, from the outside, it looks exactly this way. But the very instant of discovery, the instant of insight. Nikolai Andreevich shrugged his shoulders. Recall the history of great discoveries, Sensei continued. Take, for instance, the well-known periodic system of Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev that came to him in a dream in its final form. Moreover, it was given to him only in a partial form that could be perceived by humankind at that stage. The same story is with the structure of an atom discovered by Niels Bohr, Friedrich August Kekulé's formula, Nikola Tesla's discoveries, and many, many others. Practically all scientific ideas and theories of humanity appeared as a result of insights, intuition, and most often as revelations from above. In other words, scientists extracted those discoveries from the depths of their subconsciousness. Meanwhile, the depths of subconsciousness is the chakran called the door or the gate, call it as you wish, which can open from either one or the other side. It's just a transition to a completely different sphere, a different dimension, a different information field, or whatever you call it. So when necessary, a ready answer may be inserted into the brain of a scientist from that side. Who inserts it? Kostya inquired. The one who is on that side. Everyone perceives him differently. Some people regard him as the absolute. Others believe it's the collective mind, or Shambhala, or God. I wonder whether Shambhala and God are the same things, Urslan asked, pondering something. No, God is God, whereas Shambhala is just one of his creations. And what is Shambhala relative to humankind? Asked Nikolai Andreevich. It is simply a source of knowledge. Speaking in modern language, it's a certain bank of information, the entrance to which exists in the depths of the subconsciousness of every human. Does it mean that one can get into Shambhala without leaving one's room? Stas was surprised by his guess. Absolutely correct. We spoke a little more about the questions of interest to us, until Sensei once again glanced at his watch. All right, guys, it's getting late. Time to go home. To be honest, apparently just like the other guys, I didn't want to leave. As Genya accurately expressed our mutual opinion later, the soul demanded continuation of the feast. But alas, we needed to go home so that our relatives wouldn't worry about the long absence of our bodies. <laughs>